Okay. I have a plan. I know exactly what to do. Now stay close. Stay close. I know. Do exactly as I say. Get ready. Ready? Get her! <laughs> Welcome to State Buster. We are rolling. It is State Busters. I'm Nima Vidati. I've got Daniel Coxon. We're welcoming each other back on this episode, too. Episode one was kind of an equipment test, but, you know, we just love talking and we can just go like for so long. And I thought it was really awesome. I enjoyed the episode so much. Um, But we want to kind of focus a little bit more for episode two on why we're doing this podcast, what we want the podcast to do. Um, Not just why we're doing it, but what we want the podcast to kind of manifest in the world. And Daniel, um, you have a little document you've prepared here for us. You say you want the podcast to be the deep end of the pool, but still be accessible to newcomers. Can you elaborate? Well, what I mean by that is I want serious and committed libertarians to be able to come in here and talk shop and for them to not have to start at the beginning. Uh, I think a lot of us who have been in the movement for a long time get frustrated with the fact that, uh, you know, you you spend a lot of time explaining the roads when you really are trying to get into uh, heavier and deeper things. And it would be nice to have somewhere that, uh, like I said, the deep end of the pool where people who really know what they're doing and really know what they're talking about can really uh, lock horns and try to refine both uh, the, the ideas and the messages and the messaging and all of that. I want it to be accessible too, though. So, you know, there's no lifeguard on duty, but people should be encouraged to jump in. I, th- I feel like the thing that's going to encourage them to jump in is for us to ha- have a tone of we're welcoming people, right? Like, we're here to help you out and explain a better way, not just better for us or better for some kind of narrow group of people, but better for everybody. Like, say you don't want the weak to be exploited by the powerful. Well, I mean, liberty, that's the answer, right? Not central planning. is, But but that needs to be explained gently. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think we have to understand that, look, uh, there, there's reasons that uh, people who aren't libertarians haven't adopted the ideas yet, and it's not mm. because there's something wrong with the ideas. Uh, there's <clears throat> People have a lot of hang-ups and hold-ups, and if you're able to sort of uh, pin someone down long enough in a one-on-one discussion and really get to the root of... Uh, what's keeping them committed to uh, the state and its continued existence. Uh, it, it's rarely something that's a, a rigorous, thought-out, uh, philosophical thing. It's more of a, uh, I don't want to call it a, a, an emotive response because that, that's almost uh, dismissive. It's more of a, a sentimental thing where there, there's, they, there's something that's important to them that they don't trust could be taken care of in a society that, where the state didn't exist. And there's there's nothing that you're gonna say to that person to to change how they feel about that until until they're convinced that uh, you believe them about how important this thing is that they can't imagine being unattended by something official like like the government. So we got to be gentle, man. People are people are. It's like they have these security blankets that they're clinging to, and if we just come along and rip it out of their hands and then smack them over the face with a Rothbard book, like uh, they're, they're they're not gonna they're not gonna wake up the next day and be like, oh, I should be a libertarian. This this is a great idea. Like, yeah. They're just gonna be resentful, and they're gonna come up with more rationalizations for why they need to you know threaten their neighbors to protect that whatever that very important thing is that they're they're clinging on to. Right. Well, I mean, we've all been in arguments on Facebook and you just come out swinging. I mean, sometimes you're just looking for a fight and they are too. And it's not productive. Nobody's convinced by the end of it. So, yeah, maybe we just not need to we need to not be jerks to people on podcasts either. Um, Although sometimes it is nice to score a few points, but I feel like the judo should be directing the anger at where it belongs, where we supposed to think it belongs. Right. I mean, our anger should be at the people violating human rights it should be at the state that's where the indignation is truly righteous isn't it oh absolutely and i think that the 
the people at the top, you know, they they want us bickering among ourselves. I mean, if you're the if you're the 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 warden at a prison, if you can get some of the prisoners to keep the other prisoners in line, that's a that's a lot easier than just getting more and more guards and cracking more and more skulls. Um, you, know, you you can you can if you're trying to control people, you can uh, get a whole lot of mileage out of just cultivating a, a resentful underclass and a frightened middle class, and that way the that 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 keeps the the upper class secure, because the the people at the bottom are too busy jockeying for position against one another, and they they, they never never really zoom out to see who who the real enemy is. Yeah. Get the poor whites to hate the the blacks and get the blacks to hate the whites and then let them fight. And you're just sitting there at the top of the pyramid laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, counting the money. When I scroll my feed, it's just like a bunch of people saying, oh, yeah. It's like the state whispering in people's ears. Hey, he said your mom's a bitch. You going to take that? I just feel like it's each story is just a little whisper in the ear to whatever righteous indignation whatever outrage for whatever flavor of the culture war you are, it's just there to piss you off and make you mad at somebody who is not the power structure, make you mad at somebody who's not stealing your money via taxation or threatening to bust your head and making you scared and making you stay in your home. Um, I mean, it doesn't get any clearer who the real enemy is. <laughs> Look, at, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Where is the money and power actually accumulating? It's not accumulating at right. your boss's house. It's not accumulating at the guy down the street's house who has a little bit more money than you. It's not accumulating in the black neighborhood. It's not accumulating in the in the trailer park. It's, that's not where it is. It's accumulating in the banks and the politically connected and the people who have access to political power. It's it's this, it's not even the one percent. It's the one percent of the one percent of the one percent of the one percent. And any time you spend cultivating resentment at people who don't actually hold real power over you that the, the people who do hold real power over you are just laughing it up they think that's a funny joke it's like watching a dog chase his own tail and they get a kick out of it but while you're doing it while you're caught in the middle of it it feels good it feels like you're doing something it feels like you're taking a stand it feels like you're being defiant when you're not you're just you're just jabbing your elbow at the guy who's chained up next to you and it doesn't doesn't get you anywhere no it doesn't so what do we want this podcast to do to maybe help mitigate that or guide people away from this infighting, not just infighting in libertarianism, which has just become crazy, um, but just us infighting here at the bottom of the pile. The people who are all getting exploited are not fighting against the people doing the exploiting. They're fighting against each other. How do we thrust them in a different direction, pointing themselves at the exploiter? Well, I don't have a magic wand answer. None of us uh, do, but I mean, what are some yeah. ways you envision the podcast <laughs> of aiding in some tiny way of nudging, you know, like nudging a record like you're a DJ, getting the tempo set? Okay, synced. well, something that I think we can try to do is try to understand uh, what these cultures are that are colliding against each other. Like the uh, the different subcultures in, that are in America that are bouncing off each other, uh, they all have historical roots they all have some story behind them and a lot of the uh, uh peculiarities of this culture or that culture looking at them just in the context of the modern day um it, it, it's like looking at just a, a single frame from a movie and a, a lot of the the differences and the, the things that are sources of friction i think if there was just a, a better um you know just an intellectual understanding of how these uh you know, what is the story of this group of people and how did they get here what how did it happen where did their attitudes come from where did their um their prejudices come from because these things don't exist in a vacuum they like i said they all have some story behind them and we could all i think become better at communicating with the people we struggle to communicate with if we learned more about where the hell they came from okay give me an example like what group do you think right now needs a better clarification of their backstory. Um I don't uh I don't I don't know exactly uh you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I the one that the, the the distinction the distinction that jumps to mind uh in in my mind yeah. uh is the distinction between in the American South between sort of the Scotch Irish uh people living up in the in the mountains the Appalachians and yeah yeah okay. and the the waspy 
uh, plantation owners living down in the flatlands where it's like there, there really were two very distinct groups of early white settlers in the American South who came from very different parts of Britain and from very different circumstances. And th- th- these, these cultures you know, down the line sort of blended more or less into one coherent Southern white culture. Uh, but th- it wasn't always like that way. They, okay. they were very distinct things and their attitudes about uh, slavery, their attitudes about uh, the union, their attitudes about the civil war and stuff like that. They, they, had, they had very different uh, sort of historical experiences of these, of these things. And, the view from anywhere in 2020 is to just refer to them both as, you know, white Southerners, which they are. But uh, I think there's sort of, it's sort of a low resolution image. Or if you go up in, into the North and look at the difference between like the early white waspy settlers of the North versus the, the Catholic immigrants who poured in at the end of the 19th century or yep. the beginning of the 20th century, these are two completely different stories. And, uh, you know, a hundred years later, uh, there's all sorts of distinction between these groups that is, I think, really just lost on us. But I do think through an examination of popular culture that there is still like a memory of some of this stuff. If you look at how these different groups are portrayed in like old movies and things like that, you get sort of a window onto a world where uh, a lot of the these finer cultural distinctions really, really mattered. Uh, in these groups that were much more sort of socially isolated, didn't really have uh, mass communication the way we do. So it was like your family and your extended family and their friends. That was like your world. Right. Um, so I think like just on a cultural level, if we can learn more about where different groups come from and what their story is, we, we can make it's easier to make sense of how they think about things today. If you can understand how their grandparents thought about things and why. Right. So break it down, check the nuance. But everything seems to be in the opposite that of that right now. I, I read a Reason article and it was all about how everything's politicized. Like, how did we get to a, a, a state of the world where a mask defines who you're going to vote for, if you're wearing one or not? Um, and it goes through all <laughs> yeah, these how ridiculous all that? these <laughs> examples that make no sense. What kind of bed you sleep in? Um, you know, who your pill, who provides your pillow? Will you, will you buy from my pillow? There's a million <laughs> things that are just binary now that if you like it this way, then you subscribe to the right swath. And if you like it this way, you subscribe to the left swath. And if you're part of the left swath, you have to take it all. You know, you can't be a little left. You have to, you know, be as you have to put as many other letters in the LGBTQ plus, 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 plus. Um, and if you're right, you have to hate that. And your main thing right now has to be hating lefties and, and owning the libs and fighting this wave of quote unquote cultural Marxism that's washing over us right now. And I just look at both sides and. I can't vibe with either of them. I I can't get on board with either army, or, and I'm not going to join up either cause if if their whole thrust is to fight with each other. Dude, if you are compulsively defiant against someone's commands, you are just as much a slave as if you are compulsively obedient to their commands. Either way, you're you're handing over your your decision making to the person who's trying to wield power over you. And I think this this binary thinking that you're talking about is just sort of that dynamic uh, writ large. Like it just, it dominates everything. It swallows up everything. It's like there are two pizzas. They each have lots of toppings on them. You can pick one of those two pizzas, but uh, <laughs> either it. way, you're getting, a, you're, get, you're getting a slice that has everything on it of one of those yeah. two pizzas and you're going to eat it and you're going to like it or you don't get anything yeah. to eat. Yeah, and I'm gluten, I'm over here gluten-free or vegetarian. Not that I am, but it's just like looking at the pizza like I can't <laughs> even eat that. I don't want that. I'm like, I want a burrito. I want, a burrito. I want some kimchi. I don't know, man. Some pork rinds. Give me something else. So I have this idea I've been bouncing around. It's really just kind of a clever phrase I, I kind of want to coin called Ameristroika. And I feel like that's kind of, kind of relevant here. I love so it. So if you don't know, Dan knew immediately because Dan is erudite and uh, has been interested in this type of shit since young. But um, in the 80s, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was really into this thing called Perestroika. Basically, um, getting rid of, not getting rid of, but kind of reforming the Communist Party to be more market-based. They were poor and they hated it. They didn't like it. Um, So they were going to try to get, you know, a little bit more resources in their society. Maybe there's something to liberalizing some markets. Maybe there's something to having prices. Um, You know, there's a great anecdote uh, of, I think it was Gorbachev. It might have been somebody else. But um, 
coming to a Randall's in Houston, Texas. And I hate this story because I hate Randall's. And I feel like if you're going to shop anywhere in Texas, it needs to be H-E-B. But he went to the Randall's and his mind was blown. And this is part of his motivation, part of pushing perestroika. And it ended up being this momentous thing. Like it started off as a small thing. Like, we'll look into that. Yeah, we'll look into liberalizing the markets a little bit. But once people got their little taste of the fruits of liberty, you couldn't stop the train. You, there's no putting Pandora back in that box. And and so I kind of feel like that should be one of our thrusts. That's one of the things we're looking for is to try to get some momentum going behind. Hey, maybe, maybe we just cut some budgets. Maybe we do defund a whole police department. Maybe we see what happens. Maybe once it's awesome after that, there's momentum, and you just can't stop it. What if we try just one war at a time? Try one war at a time. Yeah. What if we just yeah yeah yeah? Let's end one war. <laughs> one war at a time. We're not we're not saying no war. It's just just one war. Is that is that Trump's been trying to end Afghanistan his whole term? Yeah, do you, do you believe that story? I think he I think he you, I think he has. Do you think he really is trying? No, he. You think so? He's ineffective, but I think I think he wants it. I think he wants that to happen. I feel like he thinks he owes that. To a lot of folks that voted for him, and, dude, it, I, you don't think so? Oh, well, I would, I would be thrilled if if he did. Um, okay, well, what's, I don't know. You, know, it, it's difficult for me to get a read on where Donald Trump, the person, uh, ends, and Donald Trump, the TV character, begins. I feel like I, every time I feel like I've, I don't think, I don't think he knows, and I think that's part of the problem. I don't think he really knows. A, yeah, I think that's definitely part of the problem. He's he's fallen into his own nightmare. Yeah, um, and I'm not sure if he even really wanted to be president or if he, how, how many misgivings he's had. I don't think he's enjoying it uh, by any means. Who would be enjoying? <laughs> Does he look like he's having fun? No. no, not at all. And I think that there are other actors within the state, other more powerful entities within the state, and the state itself. The state itself doesn't want to end any wars, regardless of if there's of, of if there's people. Oh no, the structure of it is against even letting the president have his say in that sphere here's an idea nima i have a question for you okay um in the last episode uh we had a brief discussion about the invisible hand of the market yeah and how it sort of uh, can manifest outcomes that are superior to what any single actor could uh right could make happen yeah um <clears throat> i think there is an analogous process that plays out with uh the state oh completely and all of its uh, agencies yeah where um, e even absent any conspiracy to make uh, terrible things happen, uh, because like the macro structure itself has a uh, uh, an incentive to make bad things happen. Right. Uh, it, it it finds a way. You know, it's it's like in Jurassic Park where he says life finds a way. The it's state like, finds the, the a state, way. The state the state finds a way. I agree completely. And uh, yeah, sometimes there are really bad actors who are making things happen deliberately. Other times, it's just uh, the, the right set of incentives uh, with a feedback loop just sort of bouncing off each other, and you just get this this insanity that goes on for two decades where it's like no one even no one involved is uh, thinks it's even like a coherent operation at this point. Yeah, just, there's no head of it. We don't know how to pull out. Right. We don't know how to pull out, and the individual interest along each piece of the chain, of along each strand of the web... They don't want to let their little piece of it go. They don't want to, you know, Lockheed doesn't want to let whatever revenue they get for those bombs and those drones go. And on down the line, every little actor involved in it must be getting his cut. I mean, it's it's the world's biggest honeypot, right? That's how people describe the Pentagon. Um, it gives away trillions and billions and it's insane. We think of it as a cost because we we foot the bill for it. Someone's cashing those checks. Exactly. Someone's cash. To them, it's not a cost. To them, that's the income. That's the revenue. Yeah. And they want it to be as high as possible. The war is not meant to ever be won. If it won, it defeats the purpose of it. The purpose is for the war to be continuous. I think it's just the banality of evil. It's just that's that's how business is done. That's what we do. Are you going to rock the boat? This is what your predecessor did. This is what all your peers are doing. We all live in big houses. Uh, we all go to good parties. We're having a good life. Why would, why would you rock the boat? It's pretty upsetting, man. It is upsetting. So I guess regardless of if Trump really in his heart wants to end Afghanistan or not, he said he does. He's made a few gestures. He's even asked for troop pullouts. And if you saw Liz Cheney led a thrust that uh, that ended it, she she made this bill where you have to I don't know if it if they've passed it yet. Um, but basically, there has to be a bunch of benchmarks met 
before they before a president is allowed to pull out. Right. This is the, this is this is such such horse shit. The, Look. <clears throat> okay. Go. If here's what the here's what the president could do. If the president had any balls, he could uh, sit down with the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff um, at uh, whatever the nearest Air Force base is, uh, out on a tarmac where there's a big plane, and he could say, "Okay, here's an order: get on that plane and fly to Afghanistan." Then get everyone else out of Afghanistan, and then you take the last plane home, buddy. Yeah. I mean, that, that was what Ron Paul said, right? He said, we, we marched right in. We can march right out. Yeah, I agree with yeah. you. Tell him, you fly over there, and you can't come home until this thing is done. So wrap it up. Yep. But that takes balls and principle. That takes balls. And conviction and follow through. And that's in short supply amongst yeah. anybody that's in any high office. Dude, you got you just got to take it seriously and be willing to accept that, like, look, they're probably going to try to assassinate you. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. But like, look, dude, you're the president. What do you think you were signing up for? Like, yeah, uh, I, I get I get frustrated with these people who, <clears throat> you know, they, they, they willy nilly throw other people's life around and they can't. Uh, but, but the threat of being just a one term president. Oh, that's just like lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Where it's like, dude, if you just got in there and took one stand on principle and shut down one of these batshit crazy wars and then and then got canned like that would still be be better than what we've actually gotten which is just four more years of the slow bleed followed by six months of the most massive explosion in government spending in human history but he, he can't be bothered he's a he's a he's a joke he's a showman he's a he's a um i think at it at his heart he's a he's a hustler and a narcissist and most of what we we are seeing can be explained through those things uh where it's like i don't think he's actually like uh like a sociopath, like a, like a Hillary Clinton type. I think like he, he thinks he's great and he wants everyone else to think he's great too. And he's so damn frustrated that everyone else doesn't think he's great. And like, this is like what, what drives a, a lot of his behavior is he's trying to get confirmation about how great he thinks he is. Yep. And it, it's a different sort of pathology from, uh, from the typical politician. It's still destructive and bad and not the guy you want in the white house. Uh, But I don't think he's like, I don't think he's Hitler, you know? There are some interesting and distinct things about him, though. I I, I don't think in the direction of he is a unique evil, because I think the office itself has always been evil. And that's the job, like you said. You're supposed to do evil. That's what you're signing up for. You're supposed to deploy the military might and blow up as many huts as you can. But he's dragged his feet on that. He hasn't started a new war. Yemen was started by Obama. He's expanded all the wars. Um, There's been a lot of more drone bombing. But he hasn't started a new one. Uh, which is interesting, and he's—I he, mean—that's John Bolton's book, right? That's John Bolton's biggest regret. Yeah, why won't why won't this why won't he start? Why a new didn't war? he start the war in Iran? And he called Donald Trump the most—he called that the most irresponsible thing he's ever seen in his life. Was Donald Trump not starting a war in Iran? <laughs> so he dra- okay, dude. Once again, if you're if you're the president and you've got any balls, what I would do is I would draft John Bolton <laughs> and say, guess what, Bolton? You're in the army now. Oh, man. <laughs> and then push push him out of a plane into Afghanistan. I would love that. Yeah. And uh yeah. I know here, here's here's what I think. These you you have these these But why did he hire uh, Bolton in the first place? Which is is kind of a, a weird other thing because because Sheldon Adelson wanted him to, basically. And he's really Yeah, yeah. He's given away so much more to Israel than any other president has, which is really weird too. Uh, like I don't really get it. He's really, it's like he has a weird, inconsistent, but he's, he, like you said, he's such an egoist. He's not always going to follow what the deep state wants him to do. And he does have a hate for no, a big, no, for a big right. he's, he's more unpredictable. He can, uh, someone can whisper the right thing in his ear and get different results. And this is why I think the um, people on the left have really dropped the ball. The Democratic Party in particular oh, have really dropped the ball under Trump because what we needed, what America needed. They were the worst opposition party ever. Exactly. They needed, we needed someone to actually uh, employ the machinery of the Constitution to rein in the presidential powers. You're not going to be able to completely uh, stop Trump from doing his thing, but there are a lot of areas where you could seriously hem him in. But it would all involve acknowledging parts of the Constitution that the Democratic Party wants everyone else to, to forget, forget about. about. They don't yeah. want to. They, they don't want to reintroduce that machinery into the discussion because it can be used against them too. So they can't take any sort of principled stand on it. Right. And so they just stand there. Chasing phantom Russians, doing this no go nowhere and going no, the go nowhere impeachment. I mean, it's it, they have been completely useless. And then after 
after four years, what do they come up with? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Like, give me a break, dude. Like, this is the plan. This is the plan. The plan is to do the same exact thing as in 2016 with a worse candidate. Who knew they could find one? It blows my mind that they were able to find somebody less appealing than Hillary Clinton. How on earth did they do that? I mean, he's there. I don't. I. I, I don't. <laughs> he's, he's there. I don't understand. Look, I, I'm not. I'm not a Democrat. I wasn't really. Uh, didn't have a uh, a horse in this race, but I, I was watching it, just wondering. Like, I can't believe. This is the plan. And it, you could tell it was the plan. Oh, yeah. The way they all folded at the same time. Once he won South Carolina, they all folded except Warren so she could hold on uh, just to screw over Sanders um, and then and then gave up once Sanders bowed out or however the timing went. She, she was totally in it just to screw him over uh, in favor of Joe Biden, who in this year is particularly bad because he's got so much of a hand in mass incarceration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's all him. Oh, not all him. There's a whole lot of horrible people, but... He wasn't just on, he wasn't just on that train, dude. He was leading that... Uh, he was, like, heavily involved in getting that stuff passed. He didn't just vote for it. Like, he was in, involved in getting it through. Um, dude, I look at Joe Biden, and it makes me think of when they were trying to roll out Michael Jackson for one last tour. Oh, no. Where you look at this guy, and you're like... Dude, this guy ain't going on tour. No. Like, what are you? What are you? What are you kidding? And uh, and then you think about it. You know, he might be uh, worth more to them dead than alive. Yeah. I mean, at some point, I think that's what it was. With Michael Jackson. They were like, dude, we're just gonna cash this guy in because we can't take him on tour, but we can sell a whole lot of like, uh, you know, mem- memorabilia albums and stuff. You know, you can reissue the entire catalog as a memorial. Thing. I mean, there, there's all sorts of more juice you can squeeze out of that berry even after he's dead. But he ain't going on tour. He can't dance. He's supposed to be Michael Jackson. He can barely walk across the room. <laughs> And then you look at Biden, and he's supposed to be like this, like virile man's man who's out there chumming it up and chugging beers with the the guys or whatever. Yeah. And it's like once again, he he can't even stand up and string two sentences together. Like I, I can't believe that that serious, intelligent people at the Democratic Party sat down in a room, came up with this plan, and then people nodded, and no one stood up and said, "This is bananas." Watching people ignore it. Oh yeah. And people just brush it aside. Is just my emperor has no clothes. Emperor has no clothes, and 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 it, we shouldn't be surprised, I guess, because of RussiaGate. Watching people take that seriously, watching Rachel Maddow every day. I'm not that I ever watched her, but knowing that Rachel Maddow was on TV every day, pounding away at RussiaGate, at just complete nonsense. I mean, stuff that was just made up, stuff that was faker than babies being thrown out of incubators. It's so funny, dude! I've got such a funny uh, Russian uh, <clears throat> spy story, dude. You're gonna love this. Okay. Let's go. This is this is this is this is very apropos. Right. <laughs> Gosh, when was this? This was probably like fifteen years ago or whatever. I'm I'm dating this girl, and uh, her uh, her dad, like her parents, were divorced, and her dad has uh, a new wife, and the wife has uh, a son from a previous marriage. And the kid's like like thirteen or whatever, you know. So we're out, <clears throat> we're out to dinner, and uh, the 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 dad and his uh, his new wife are telling me this story. Really, the dad's telling the story. And he's like, so uh, <clears throat> we had this problem where, um, you know, we got this bill on our cable stuff where, like, someone had had, had downloaded a, a bunch of, uh, you know, adult material. So there was just, like, hundreds of dollars worth of porn had been ordered on, on the cable account, you know? Mm. <laughs> and it's like... <laughs> I used to be a cable guy. I Is know. it maybe your 13-year-old son or whatever? And the guy's uh, new wife, her theory was, oh, it's Russian hackers. <laughs> <laughs> the Russians did it. She, she you had, saw a wild this, in the live. Was, Russians did it. This was in like 2005, dude. This was in 2005, oh, okay, 2006. Okay. This was a long time ago. It's foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> she had seen some episode of like Inside Edition or something, and they were talking about Russian hackers doing whatever. I don't know. But uh, th- you have a 13 year old son, and you have this. You know, two $200 porn bill, and you jump to the conclusion that, oh, well, it, it must be Russian hackers. Yeah. The cognitive dissonance is that strong. You're in that much of a denial. <laughs> the refusal to just look at the obvious explanation yeah. that's right in front of you yeah. is just mind-boggling. I mean, and that's how it started, right? They didn't want to admit that they lost because they sucked so bad because Hillary was such a terrible... They didn't want to admit that, so they had to come up with a scapegoat. The Russians did it. The Russians did it. 
Oh man, I love it. Imagine a world like imagining the Russians doing all this stuff. It definitely made made things more exciting. Like that was definitely like would have been like a cool movie if the if that really was what was going on. And I'm sure the Russians are always spying and hacking shit and whatever. But the idea that that was like the operative dynamic that produced the result uh, is, is 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 just just so so absurd. You know, like that some twenty thousand right. <laughs> dollar Facebook ad campaign with the arm wrestling Jesus or whatever is what turned the election. <laughs> It's just like this smart bomb of a meme that just hit exactly the right target to like Vulcan death grip against Hillary Clinton's presidential ad campaign. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. The left doesn't know how to meme and Putin is the meme master. He's the meme avatar. (laughs) It's hilarious. (laughs) He is a meme. That's true. His meme is hilarious. All his memes are. Uh all right. So, yeah, people are chasing all these crazy directions that make no sense. They're running after Joe Biden, pretending Joe Biden isn't in, isn't senile. And even if Joe Biden was all there, that Joe Biden isn't resp- directly leading the charge for so many of the things from decades ago that have made life horrible now. Uh, mass incarceration with his crime bills and his tough on crime stances. And then the Iraq war. Kind of a big one. I mean, the Iraq war is widely regarded as one of the biggest missteps in American history. Downstream from that, all the other wars in the Middle East, uh, Libya, Yemen, Syria, I mean, all started because of the Iraq war and how awful it was and our downstream consequences of it. And Joe Biden was the big part of the Democratic Party that helped the Democrats actually vote for that. He was the one lobbying for it and making sure everybody was whipped into shape and on board for it. Um, And that's the guy. And he might pick Kamala Harris as his running mate. And people are just pretending like, like this is all fine. This is all fine. They're the, the dog in the meme where the house is burning down. And they're saying this is fine. Yeah. And, it, it re- and you drew this beautiful parallel in our show prep. And it, it's kind of perfect. It's kind of like cargo cults. Cargo cults. It's kind of like folks in some Pacific island seeing a British airbase and mimicking it and wondering why the planes aren't coming and dropping off goodies for them. Let's Go uh, ahead and expand on that, Dan. Let's let's review what a cargo cult is for the people who who are not Please familiar do. with it. So um in the South Pacific during World War II, uh, I think primarily in New Guinea, uh, the British showed up and started building these airstrips on these little islands that had had only really trivial contact with the outside world. And then all of a sudden in the midst of World War II, they come face to face with you know, all this modern technology as these men show up on advanced boats made out of, you know, steel or whatever you build warships out of. And uh, they build these airstrips and then these flying planes land. And then the men pull even more new fancy equipment off of the planes. And the people on these islands have have, have never seen anything like this before. All, all of a sudden they're thrust into the most, ad, uh, you know, advanced technological endeavor in uh, human history up to that point, World War II. So one of the things they tried to do was uh, was mimic what the uh, the ground crews were doing, and they thought that other planes would land and bring them stuff. So they went out and they cleared land on the islands, <laughs> and they built these like uh, air traffic control towers out of palm trees and stuff. And they built uh, they, they built things that looked like what they could see on these uh, British airstrips. And then they would walk around and they would mimic uh, the hand motions of the ground crews, and they would go through all these rituals. And then they look up at the sky and wondered, well, why aren't the planes landing on our airstrip and bringing us more cargo? Like this is clearly this is how you do it. What's the problem? And uh, yeah, we did everything right. And I think that uh, on on both sides of the political spectrum, we have people who they, they're, they're looking at results and they're looking at uh, actions and they're having a real hard time parsing out which actions are producing which results. And it, it's mm-hmm. like the people sitting mm-hmm. on the island. If, if all you've if all you've seen is the ground crew show up on a boat and then all this other stuff happens, you have no conception of the the hundreds of thousands of people uh, back on the mainland somewhere who are building all these things in factories and all the complicated uh, processes and supply chains that, that are being done to make all this technology happen, all you see is the the seemingly magical result. Right. And so you go out there and all you can mimic is, uh, all you can really attempt to do is recreate the magic. But magic isn't what's making it happen. So you just, you're just waving your arms around. It, it's, it's like a rain dance. Nothing actually happens. <laughs> yeah, and that's what presidential elections are, aren't they? <laughs> Every, they we're, we, we did what we were supposed to do. We had debates. We had people go to primaries. We picked a guy. Here's our guy. 
and then the guy's gonna get uh, you know somebody's gonna win and we're gonna sit there where's 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 the prosperity <laughs> where's the good stuff that we're supposed to come from this ritual we do every four years it's gonna get better right it's like getting married and hope that you'll fall in love yeah but I don't know if it's gonna get better again man I, I don't I don't know where you go from here what what do you do after a Donald Trump presidency what do you do as a country when nobody when, when every single thing is divided at least in a binary where half the country hates the other half of the country um worse than they hate foreigners in a lot of cases and you know Americans are notorious for hating foreigners or not caring about them enough to bomb them um <laughs> it's it's scary and ominous um and I was hoping cargo cults would be our redemption in the third act <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I don't like I said. I don't know exactly how how to undo it, but I do think, look, hating people you haven't met that's that's a that's a learned behavior. Yeah, that's something you you taught. It's something you taught yourself how to do. Okay, and if you learn how to do it, that means you can unlearn how to do it, or you can learn how to stop doing. So it. So we can unfight the culture war with that as a weapon. Unlearning, yeah, the, the hate. Yeah, and, and I mean well, that's a nice speech. How, how do you actually do that? <laughs> right. Um, I, I I don't know exactly. Um, sh- should I tell this uh tell the uh, the stand your ground or be a punk story? Should we do that? Yeah, yeah. Because I think that kind we of have time for that. Are we going too long or we're a little bit long? But that kind of wraps it up. So okay, it, it kind of does wrap it up. Yeah, de escalation, right? So you know that's kind of what we want. Everything seems to be escalating. People hurting each other, running each other over, cops shooting tear gas, people shooting judges. Um. It's crazy out there, man. So some de-escalation would be nice if we could hear a good story where that happened. Okay, so um, this is a story I heard a couple days ago on uh, a podcast that's hosted by a British gentleman named Sean Atwood. Uh, He is a former inmate and went to prison for a long time for, uh, I think, uh, smuggling ecstasy. And he has a podcast where he mostly interviews former prisoners. And a lot of them are like hardcore guys who are in for a long time for serious business. And they've got just these bad shit crazy stories a lot of them it, it's 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 pretty wild um but he told this story this is um this is something that actually happened to him so he was uh he had like a trivial beef with some guy where it was like that he was sitting on a crate and the guy just came up and was like you're you're sitting in my seat and the situation was uh that if he didn't uh, stand his ground against this one guy he knew he was going to have problems with everybody on the yard yeah so he was like the guy who was coming at him he knew that this guy had already killed two people in the prison system it was a guy who'd been in for a long time but he was like even knowing that i'd I'd rather just have to deal with him than have to deal with everyone else so he stood his ground and the guy is uh really running his mouth on him says well i'm gonna come find you later and we're gonna settle this i'm gonna kill you blah 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 all this stuff and over the course of a few weeks, this guy keeps keeps talking shit about how he's going to come get him and he's going to shank him or whatever. Over a chair. Yeah, over over a seat, over a seat. Over a seat. And while this is happening, the guy, the guy telling the story, Sean, uh, he's training with a buddy of his who's like a martial arts expert, and they've been working out together, and there's like he's trying to come up with a plan of like how he's going to deal with this guy when he comes at him. And they knew that the guy had a steel rod in one of his legs. So they sort of came up with, with a plan of attack of how, like, you know, if you could go for the go for the rod and, and break that or disable that, that's gonna, you know, they had they had a whole plan and they were working on it for a few weeks. This was going on for a while. Wait, they they thought his weak point, his weak spot was gonna be a steel rod. No, they <laughs> they, they knew that the guy had been shot in the leg at uh, some point earlier, and they okay. knew he had a steel rod. At, they knew like where it was in his leg. Uh, so they were like, if you can, if you can like snap kick that. Uh, that's the, the where the rod connects to the bone. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You. That's that's the bad leg. Yeah. Um. So while this is going on, the guy keeps talking more and more trash, like he's gonna come get the guy to the point that the other people in the on the prison yard are like, dude, you've been talking a lot. If you don't follow through on this, we're gonna come kick your ass because you're. This is a lot of trouble you're starting. You're running your mouth a whole lot. You gotta. You better deliver, or or you got a problem. So it got to the point where. Uh, uh, the host Sean, he's antsy for it. He he's like, I'm ready. Let's do it. I should just go go find him and let's let's do this shit. And the guy who's training him is like, Look, dude, if you go find him and you initiate the attack, they're gonna attack more time onto your onto your prison sentence. You you'll be stuck in here longer. You don't want to do that. You got to wait for him to come to you. There's there's cameras everywhere. They'll know. Yeah. So eventually, the guy shows up in Sean's cell. And Sean gets up and he's he's ready to go. You know, he's like, This is it. 
but the guy doesn't look like he, he wants to fight. He doesn't say anything. And Sean is worried that this is like a trick where he's going to... Um, lure him with a false sense of comfort. Yeah, yeah. lure him in yeah. and then suck, sucker punch him or something like that, you know? Okay. Uh huh. But then the guy says, uh, I, I came to apologize. Um, I, uh, I was just fooling around and uh, uh, I shouldn't have done it. And Sean is like shocked and he's like, well, look, dude, someone with your background who's killed two people, you understand that if you start making threats like that, people around here are not going to see that as fooling around. We're going to take it really seriously. And it's not a joke. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know. It's just that, uh, you know, I've been in prison for 30 years and I'm going to be out in a couple months. And if I kill you, they'll either execute me or lock me away for life. And like, that'll be it. Yeah. Heavy. And then, uh, he takes sort of lets out, lets out a sigh. And he says, you know, all I know is heroin. I'm going to get out of here. I've got some money. My dad had a business. But my whole life is just, for the last 30 years, has just been heroin, heroin, heroin. And I don't know what's going to happen when I get out of there. And he was like, look, those two guys I killed, it was when I first got here, and it was a kill or be killed situation. I didn't, I didn't want to hurt, hurt those guys, but I had to do it to survive. And that was, that was 30 years ago. They just put more time on my thing. And I know if I do it again, I'm, I'm done. But I'm terrified of what's going to happen when I get out of here. And the guy telling the story is like, look, like, I stood up not just ready to kill this guy, but like with a plan f- to do it. Like, and 30 seconds later, I want to give the guy a hug. Yeah. That the moment of, of the apology followed up by the, the vulnerability and the honesty somehow d- diffused someone who's, you know, standing a few feet away from you, ready to ready and willing with a plan to kill you. Yeah. And look, that's, that's where we're at as a, as a society. This coming presidential election, we are, people are ready to go. They are. Like, it is, <clears throat> there, there is a very slim uh, chance that whatever the outcome is, it's going to be something that the losing side is going to accept. The, the, the time between the next election and when the next president actually gets uh, inaugurated, uh, it's going to be the most dangerous time period in American history since, since the Civil War. Dude. Like, this, is, this is so dangerous. Yeah. People are cocked and ready to go, and everyone has this idea in their head that they're going to they're gonna turn the violence up to where they think it should be, and then it's just going to stop. No. And it's like, that's not, <laughs> not, that's not what's going to happen, dude. Right. You're going to nudge that dial a little bit, and it's just going to keep going. Yeah. It's going to keep going, and it's going to get worse and worse and more dangerous, and more people are going to die. And six months later, no one's even going to remember what started it. It's just going to be about getting the guy who got your buddy. It's going to be so bad. Well, I hope not. We got to find ways to i to to identify with, empathize with, and attune like sentimentally attune our message to people who we have been dismissive of, people who we have written off. Like we like this is it really is a matter of life and death. We're we are getting to the point where people are going to start pulling those triggers and not looking back, and we have to find a way to defuse this situation. It's the far side of this fight is not going to be peace, freedom, and prosperity. It's just going to be yeah. more violence. Yeah. I mean, because of what we said in episode one, I don't know if that that made the cut because uh, we talked for about twice the amount that we ended up cutting for episode one. Um, but the people who win civil wars are the most ruthless, vicious people who take no prisoners and have no quarter for dissent. I mean, that that's who comes to the fore in situations like that in places like Syria. You know, that's that's who gains ground. It's not moderates. We can't have rebellious moderates you know that's as, as much a fantasy here rebellious moderates yeah we can't have moderate rebels you know we we can't have that doesn't work so i don't know what the answer is but i think that's a good general direction is finding ways to de-escalate finding ways to not want to kill other americans <laughs> and finding a way to hey realize where the common ground is and that we have a common enemy and that most of what we're fighting about is the way that common enemy, the state, imposes its will on our enemy or on us in in the place of our enemy, right? We we think that the Republicans are going to get us or we think that the Democrats are going to get us, um, but it's the state that either of them are using as the tool, as the weapon against whoever you think is against you. A retargeting, but first, before any of that, a de-escalation. Yes, a de-escalation. We need to step back from the edge. Once, once we once we step off, it, we're just gonna keep falling. Third eye blind style, bro. We we need a, a third eye blind song. <laughs> it's gonna save the world. 
Um, all right, we'll get to writing that. And um, I think that's our time here. Did you have anything to finish it out or any projects you want to plug or you just stoked to, to be working on State Busters? No, I think what we should do is really do a, like a, a cold fade out into that um, uh, Third Eye Blind song. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I can't. I'm not, I'm not even going to try to sing it, but let's just go. I wish you would step back from that ledge, my friend. You could cut ties with all the lies that you've been living in. And if you do not want to see me again, I would understand. Get her. That was your whole plan. Get her. We're scientific. 